Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing part 11 already of our Planet Zoo uh, mod spotlights, so very interested to get stuck into that, so we've got a really interesting bunch of animals today, some really cool ones, some horses, some penguins, so yeah, we better get stuck into it, so we're going to be starting with flamingos today, we have got the lesser flamingo, though it's not necessarily not great it's just lesser than the greater flamingo <laughs> but the lesser flamingo is a species of flamingo that's found in sub-saharan africa and northwestern india for whatever reason just pretty interesting range so these guys are the smallest species of living flamingo and they get to about um 1.2 to 2.7 kilos and stand about 80 to 90 centimeters tall and the total length from their beak to the tail is about 90 to 105 centimeters, and they have this white plumage, pinkish white plumage. The clearest difference between this and the greater flamingo is that the only other old world flamingo is that it has a much more extensive black on the beak and also a lot smaller, so it's a lot smaller than the greater flamingo, so that's a good way to tell them apart. So they may be the most numerous, with a population at its peak believed to be about 2 million individual birds. And they feed primarily on algae and very alkaline lakes, so things like salt flats. So the presence of these groups are an indication that it's very uh, alkaline. And these guys also use the pigments like carotenoids to give them their pink color. That's why often in zoos they'll be fed carrots and stuff to get that pink color out of them. Oh, you did a poo. <laughs> Pretty cool. So... These guys live in Africa and northwestern India, so they're subject to a lot of predation from baboons, fish eagles, hyenas, big cats, foxes, storks, vultures, and things like that. So even though they uh, are the most numerous species, they're considered near threatened because their population is considered to be declining and there's not very many breeding sites, so that's always at risk if uh, humans want to develop that area, so that could also put a big knock on the population. So there's already two populations in some East African lakes that have already been, uh, had some heavy metal poisoning, which is really difficult because this is where they breed, so obviously the animals get poisoned, so there's lots of chemicals getting put in the water. And they are considered, even though they're near threatened, these kind of issues may become worse and worse in the future and could even put them as endangered, sadly. But these are wonderful cool animals. I really like how they did this one. See, the baby's bigger than the adults, but that's just because you can't change the babies yet. That's really, really cool. Really interesting flamingo species. So now we're going to move on to the next animal. We've got another tapir, which is awesome. Where's the other one? There's one swimming near the baby. So we have got... The mountain tapir, also known as the Andean or woolly tapir, is the smallest of the four tapir species uh, and you are the only ones that live outside of tropical rainforest. So these guys live in the mountains and they're easily distinguished by this white lip that they have and they're obviously their size. I think they're a really cool species of tapir. So these guys are black or very dark brown with pale hairs occasionally across their body and their fur becomes noticeably paler on their underside. And in adults they romp have part, uh, part, paired patches of bare skin which helps to indicate sexual maturity. And the eyes are blue, but they change to pale brown as the animal ages. And these guys, unlike other tapirs, have a longer fur since they live in cooler habitats. And it can reach between 3.5 centimeters uh, in some individuals. So these guys, as adults, they usually get around 1.8 uh, meters in length, or 0 0.75 to 1 meter tall in height at the shoulder. And they typically between, weigh between 136 and 250 kilograms, while... The sexes are similar sizes, females tend to be between 25 and 100 kilograms heavier than the males, so females tend to be a little larger, and like other tapirs, they have this very flexible proboscis that they use to grab food, and I think they're very wonderful. Let's have a look at the babies. Here's the babies. We've got a baby one. Very cute. So these guys are herbivores and live on all sorts of plants, and these are very important uh, speed dis seed dispersers in the high Andes, so they eat a lot of plants and the plants pass through the digestive system and are spread as the tapir moves around the ecosystem, Whoa. pooping them out, so they're very important. 
And these guys are also prey for animals like mountain lions, or, or also called cougars, uh, speckled bears, and occasionally jaguars. And these guys uh, communicate. That was a good example. They have these high whistles that they use to communicate. And they're very shy and tend to be crepuscular. That means they only come down during the early morning and late afternoon. So they kind of don't go out in extremes. And they mark their territory with dung piles and urine and rubbing on trees. And females will sometimes engage in these behaviors. And these territories usually can be over about 800 hectares. And females have larger territories than the males. So these guys are found around the cloud forests of the eastern and central uh, mountains of Colombia, Ecuador, and as far north as Peru. And they may be found in western Venezuela, but have been extirpated. And they commonly live in elevations between 2,000 and 4,300 uh, meters, or about 14,000 feet. And these rumply fall below freezing, so they're still kind of like trees and stuff. And they tend to inhabit the forest in the dry month, and then they kind of move out when the biting insects pester them. So that's when they move into the mountains. I think you're very cute. Let's, let's move you to your parents. There you go. So these guys are considered the most threatened. They're considered endangered since they there's only a there was a 20% chance the species could have been come extinct in early 2014 because of their fragmentation of their habitats. But they're also hunted for their meats, uh, where their toes, proboscis, and intestines are used for folk medicines and aphrodisiacs. And but today, usually the main issues is farmers and then deforestation, agriculture, along with mining and poaching being the main threats to these species. So these are the most endangered tapir, which is sad. There's believed to be only about 2,500 individuals living in the wild and making it very difficult for them to be studied. And there's some individuals in zoos like Los Angeles Zoo, uh, San Francisco Zoo, uh, and a couple other zoos around the world. Even though these individuals in zoos don't really have that much genetic diversity, so they can't really help the population in the wild, but it's very important that these guys are preserved because they do a very important role in their habitats, especially in the Andes. So, looks like we've got to move to the next animal now. I think that came out pretty well. So next one we've got is the Nile Crocodile with some babies. So this is a new, new species. So Nara crocodile is a freshwater crocodile that lives across the freshwater habitats of sub-Saharan Africa and even in places like Egypt. And they found all sorts of different habitats. Very, very well-known species. They are the second largest reptile, the only smaller than the saltwater crocodile. And females are usually 30% smaller than the males and have this thick armored skin, of course, even though they look like they're eating each other. So these guys are opportunistic apex predators, so these guys will kind of take whatever they can. They can eat zebras, they can eat people, and they do regularly eat people, uh, fish, uh, reptiles, birds, mammals, whatever, <coughs> and ambush them using the water. They'll come out and attack them. They're very, very good at waiting. And they are agile and wait for the opportunity. Even swift prey cannot be uh, escape these guys because they just happen so quick. And they have, it, like other crocodiles and crocodilians, they have a very, very powerful bite that they use to dispatch prone. And believe it or not, these guys are also relatively social. They'll uh, hang out in basking spots and then uh, have these large food sources and hang out together, especially around carcasses or schools of fish. And they have a strict hierarchy that's determined by their size. These guys are like floating a little bit. <laughs> so these crocodiles tend to respect each other, but when in French they can get violent and even rip each other's limbs off and even kill each other. And one cool thing about crocodiles is that they're very, very good parents. They will lay their eggs in a mound and then the mother will take them in their mouth when they hatch and then put them in the water and watch over them where they'll eat insects and take care of themselves because young crocodiles are very susceptible to predators. And they're considered the most deadly species of crocodile and are responsible for hundreds of deaths each year. So, locally they can be endangered, but overall they're doing okay. They're considered least concern. But, yeah, obviously attacking people is not very much a good thing. So, you, you got to be wary of these crocodiles. I think I've already covered this guy, so I won't go too much in detail. This is just a new species I wanted to show off, and I think it looks really, really cool. Wonderful, wonderful. Nice to have some more crocodiles. So let's move on to the next animal. We have got another African animal. We have got the 
Ronentelope. So where's the male? There's a female. There's a male, I think. Yeah, there we are. There's a male. So this is the Ron antelope. This is the savannah antelope native to West Central and Southern Africa and is named after the Chevrolet project whose name was taken after the French Antelope Chevrolet. So it's named after a person. So these guys are actually one of the larger species of antelopes. They're only elands, bongos and larger male great kudus are larger. They get between 190 to 240 centimeters from the head to the base of the tail. And, and the tail measures about 37 to 48 centimeters. The body weight of a male can get between 242 and 300 kilos. And the females are typically 223 to 280. And the shoulders are typically around 130 to 140 centimeters tall. And the name for their run coloration are reddish brown. And they have lighter underbellies. And they have these very short erect manes that make them look cool, almost like a horse. And they have these bands down their face that are black and very red nostrils so they're very similar to things like sable antelopes and can be confused with them often because they're wraps over range and also things like blue bucks which are extinct now so you can't confuse them because you can't see them in the wild and these guys are found around woodlands and grass and savannas across sub-saharan africa uh such bunches of zambezi and mbolo woodlands where they eat few trees, little with a few trees, and they eat midlith grasses, so they kind of just eat midlith grasses and commonly fight for dominance in these herds while they attack each other at the knees. It's pretty, pretty, pretty brutal. So, yeah, they're a cool species of antelope. They're related to things like uh, sable antelope, these six different subspecies, which we're not sure of the validity of them just because subspecies uh, tend to be old. These subspecies, at least, not really backed on genetic evidence. These are related to things like blue buck, which is extinct, and sable antelope, which are pretty interesting. Good boys. So yeah, there's the father, and then there's mother. I like the color variation. You can see this one's darker, and then you can have a look at the baby. Oh, that's the dad. And then we've got this one. Cute baby. Oh, baby's about to mature. That's all right. He will be fine. So let's move on to the next species. We've got a couple penguins now. We have got the chin strap penguin. Look at this little guy here. The chin strap penguin is a species of penguin that's found across the Southern Ocean and the Southern Pacific and Antarctic Oceans. And the name comes from this little black stripe that they have under their chin, like a chin strap. If you guys know. Uh, the type of beer that you can get that's like a little chin strap. It looks awful, but it looks much better on a penguin than it does a person, honestly. But that's where the name comes from. They're also called bearded penguins, ringed penguins, or stonecatcher penguins due to their loud, harsh call. And these guys get to about 68 to 76 centimeters tall, or go to a length of, and they get a weight of 3.2 to 5.3 kilograms, and with their weight varying throughout the year. And males tend to be a little bit bigger and taller than females. So the adult flippers have a black and white edge and this is a very common thing seen in aquatic animals. They have counter shading so they can see this black top and this light bottom so it helps contrast them against the light and the dark of the ocean. And these guys are found across Antarctica, the uh, Argentina, Falkland Islands, uh, South Georgia and vagrants have been found in New Zealand, St. Helga and South Africa. So these guys eat a lot of really small things. They eat krill, small fish, uh, squid, things like that. Oh, didn't that view. That was a bit of a click on my mistake. So these guys kind of cheat whenever they can, and they have the stick blubber that they use to insulate themselves. And the only real predator of these guys is the leopard seal. And they decrease about 5 to 20% their populations because of the leopard seals, but they are also preyed on on land by skewers and giant petrels that uh, eat the babies and prey on eggs as well. And Antarctic fur seals have been known to occasionally kill these guys. So on land they kind of build these circular nests of rocks where they lay their eggs and the females take shifts about 6 days each where they take care. The chick hatches about 37 days and they have fluffy grey backs and white fronts 
and they stay to the nest around 20 to 30 days before they join the other chicks in a crèche. And then after 50 to 60 days, they molt and get in their adult feathers and go out to sea. And they're generally considered one of the most ill-tempered penguins, so that's something you got to take in mind if you're ever going to talk to them. So the estimated global population of these guys is about 8 million, although they're believed to be decreasing. Their population is very fragmented, so they seem to be increasing or stable. So it kind of just depends on the area, so they seem to be doing okay at the moment. But obviously with things like climate change, which is really affecting animals in the polar regions of the world, since of the ice melting, something you got to be really careful about and will affect species like these. And speaking of penguins, we've got another big penguin here. We have got the emperor penguins. So if you guys know much of the penguins, you'll know these guys along with these cute babies. We'll have to talk about them soon. So... See, these guys are the tallest and the heaviest of the penguins and live in Antarctica. They're the only species that breeds on Antarctica itself. And they reach about 100 to 130 centimeters tall and average between 22 and 45 kilos. And like other penguins, they're flightless. And, well, the, well I mean, they, they only breed in the winter, so. They are flightless like other penguins and swim around using their flippers as, well, their wings as flippers so they can swim around pretty well. Pretty cool penguins and these guys make these really interesting vo vocalizations and try, try and distinguish their chicks from others and offspring and things like that. Really, really cool species. So these guys are pretty much found exclusively in Antarctica and they breed in the winter, so they kind of, if you've seen March of the Penguins, it's a very, very <laughs> full story of them coming in and then they huddle up and take care of themselves. If you've seen Happy Feet, it's the same thing, since they're all Emperor Penguins. And they have all sorts of cool adaptions to living in these frigid temperatures, like uh, they will dive deep to kind of like help with the oxygen and they have lots of hemoglobin that are be able to bind and transport oxygen much better than us because they have a lot more hemoglobin in their blood. And they found at really low latitudes. So these guys' population is believed to be about, in 2009, 595,000 adult birds and they're located around Antarctic and Subantarctic. But their beliefs that, well obviously with climate change, that's going to be a big effect on their food and have a big effect on them, which kind of sucks, but, but I've already mentioned that with the Chinsat penguins, so you got to make sure climate change doesn't happen. So they're very, very social, and during the breeding season, they'll all come up on land. During the winter, they'll huddle up together, and then as it kind of happens and winter rolls around, that's when the females come back, and then they kind of all stocked up on food then the male can go and grab food and the female takes care of the chick it's a very interesting behaviors these guys are also preyed on by the same species of chinchat penguins are preyed upon like leopard seals skewers attack chicks and orcas have been known to take on uh emperor penguins so these guys primarily eat like cephalopods and crustaceans and krill uh, hook squid, uh, glacial squid, and things like that are very, very common things to find in their stomachs. And these guys aren't very common in zoos, unlike king penguins. But there are zoos that have been able to hold them, but unsuccessfully. And obviously, if you guys know these guys, they're known from... Oh, must have been a baby born. Oh, yeah. If you guys seen Happy Feet or March of the Penguins, they have a big cultural like impact. And we can see this is a bit big for a realistic one, but you can't change the baby sizes just yet. But we can see they've got this really cool hood going on. So yeah, cool species of penguin. Happy, one born just as we were talking. Very cute. Now we've got the red wolf. Too bad they matured just as... I was going to show you the baby, but there's not much difference with the baby. We already covered this guy in a previous video. So these guys are native to southeastern US and they're very similar to grey wolves. They are believed to be hybrids of grey wolves and coyotes. And there's a big debate whether they should be considered their own species, either their own hybrid, things like that. 
I've discussed it in previous videos about these guys, but I think this one is fun to show because it's a new mod and it's got a new species as well. So, pretty, pretty cool animal. I personally think that they are worth conserving, especially since they're the rarest mammal in the United States. There's population, I think the wild population is no more than 30 at the moment, but there are captive populations that are about 100 or so. And they're considered uh, really, really low. That's why they're protected under the Endangered Species Act. They're considered critically endangered or endangered. And these guys were found around uh, the United States, around Texas, Ohio, uh, New York, uh, even extremely southern Canada. And they were, like other wolves, they were kind of just mercilessly hunted to uh, near extinction because of fear of attacking their cattle and their livestock. So as I mentioned, yeah, the taxonomy is very weird because... We do have some red wolf fossils, but we don't know whether we call them a species. It can be kind of an adaptive thing. Potentially these guys to adapt to a changing world after the ice age, they kind of bred with coyotes and kind of created this new species and they can breed fine. It's just whether we consider them a species or not. It's this is kind of taxonomy. It's kind of finicky and these guys are descended from hybrid populations of coyotes and gray wolves so it's are they a species are they not do we same with the dingo as well do we consider dingoes their own species uh, i personally wouldn't and i would consider these guys not really their own species but i think they should be worth conserving anyway so if you guys want to do your research on this it's really interesting uh to learn about how these guys developed i believe that these guys kind of split between during the the red wolf and the eastern uh, they kind of split like within the past 30,000 years I believe so 150,000 to 300,000 years or something like that so it's believed that these guys are hybrids pretty cool though I like these guys a lot so too bad we just missed out on having the baby but red wolves cool animals so now we've got a second to last animal. We've got a couple horses coming up. We have got the Preswalski horse. A really cool horsey. <laughs> Wonderful. This is a remake uh, by Narwhaler of another mod that was a new species. So it's a, another remake, kind of similar to the African Leopard remake I covered a while ago. So these guys are a very rare and endangered horse. They were once considered extinct in the wild. And been reintroduced into their native range of Mongolia. So these guys also have a very uh, candid history, kind of similar to uh, dingoes, where they're considered they're believed to be true for wild horses, but they're actually potentially some really, really early ferals. The DNA suggests that these about the Bonin Empire or the Bonin culture about five thousand years ago. These descended from a population that kind of was domesticated by people and then escaped to become feral but it's a very complicated thing it's potential that they diverged from each other actually about forty-five thousand years ago so it has potential that they are wild horses it's kind of just what people uh have, the evidence is showing it's kind of a little bit conflicted there so the, there was a 2018 study that suggested look at that, it looked like the 4th millennium uh, domestic horses, that's where they found and considered them the same, so they may be feral descendants of them, but they may be their own distinct wild population. I think it's a really cool area of study and you should do your research on that. These guys are much stockier than domestic horses, even though they're the same species. <coughs> Sorry about that. And they can get to about lengths of 2.1 meters and weigh about 300 kilograms. And they have much ranging in their coats, like they have this pale yellowish on their coat and even these little stripes on their legs, they're really wonderful looking. And these guys are found in groups of about 4 to 15 members, consisting of an old stallion and in his mares and foals. And these populations that have been introduced have similar um, groups, uh, group uh, structures. And they do live very similar to modern feral horses, not too different. They're estimated to live in an area between 1.2 and 
square kilometers in the Hidushi National Park and 150 to 825 in, oh, what's the name? In the Greater Gobi Strictly Protected Area, where their ranges and harems slightly overlap. And they have very few modern predators, but they do have get preyed upon by Himalayan wolves. So these guys' diets consist very much of lots of grasses and they tend to favor different species at different times of year. It's very complicated, but it's very cool. Like in the winter, they'll eat certain species, in the summer, they eat different species. And when these guys mate, they mate during the late spring to early summer, and the stallions do not start looking for mating partners around the age of five. Stallions will assemble groups of mares, and then males will come and challenge them for dominance. Females will give birth at the age of three and have a gestation of about 12 months. So the foals are able to stand an hour after birth and the rate of infant mortality around foals is 25%. 83.3% 83 of the death resulting by the leading stallion infanticide. So that means the stallion either kills them or one comes up and kills the offspring. Kind of similar to like lions. And foals begin grazing within a few weeks but are not weaned until 13 months after birth and they reach sexual maturity about two years old. So these guys, as I mentioned, they were extinct in the wilds, but due to captive breeding programs, they were intensively bred and reintroduced into areas across Mongolia. And even just last year, there was a cloned uh, Przewalski horse named Kurt. And it was actually just like late last year. And he was successfully cloned and bred. He lives in the San Diego Zoo now. So that's really cool that we're using that kind of technology to help a critically endangered species like this. So now they're not instinct in the wild, they're now critically endangered. Wonderful bunch. And we'll have a look at the babies. Where's the baby standing up? There we go. Cute, 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 as usual. And lucky the last, but definitely not the least, we have got uh, Grevy's Zebra. So the Grevy Zebra, also known as the Imperial Zebra, is the largest living wild equid and the most threatened of the three zebra species. And these guys are named after Jules Grevy, who, uh, and it is found in Kenya and Ethiopia, and compared to other zebras it's kind of a lot narrower and cooler. So these guys are the, get to about 2.5 to 2.75 uh, meters in head to body length with a 75 centimeter tail and standing between 1.45 and 1.6 centimeters high at the shoulder 1.6 meters high at the shoulder and weigh between 350 and 450 kilograms so that's very very big and they are particularly mule like appearance just because they're very basal in the clade and they differ just from being larger and have very very like smaller stripes they have very thinner stripes compared to mountain and plain zebras and the one other best way to just tell them is just they're larger and they have a little bit more uh, differences between them, especially their size. So these kind of stripes are developed to help uh, get rid of insects. So biting insects won't affect them because they can't tell judge the distance between the insect itself and the skin. So it's very hard for them to try and judge and it helps protect them from biting insects. So these guys are found around northern Kenya and some isolated populations in Ethiopia. And they're extirpated from South Sudan for unknown reasons. And they live in these kind of bushlands and barren plains. And they are ind intermediate between these African living African wild asses and these water dependent plain zebras. So they're kind of intermediate between them and their ecology. So these guys are a little bit more uh, keen to browse rather than uh, other species of uh zebra they're a little bit more common to browse and when there's gr not grass they will commonly browse and their high ground ferment uh fermenting digestive system allows them to subsist on much lower nutrient uh food that is a requirement for these animals and they can survive up to a week without water but will drink daily when it's plentiful they often migrate to better wetland uh, better watered habitats when they can and may just require a lot more water when they're lactating and even will dig holes and defend them if needed. And these guys are also preyed upon by lions, also by spotted hyenas. 
uh, African wild dogs and leopards, even though these never really attack adults, even if they're desperate, but they will attack young animals, really only lions attack adults, and they're fiercely protective of their young, so you gotta be careful of that. So similar to Briswalski's horses, they kind of live in territories during the wet season, and they have these stallions, usually these territories, along with bachelor herds. And up to nine stallions, they compete for a mare outside its territory, and they kind of just maintain that and try and get as many females as they can to live in their territory so they can breed with them and have babies. And they can mate and give birth year-round, but most mating takes place in the early raining season, and births mostly take place between August and September after the long rains. And an estrus mare may visit as many as four territories, and females will mate with them, so they kind of maintain a territory and the females will kind of go around just picking the males they like. And the most dominant males will have control over water sources, which will attract bears with uh, dependent foals. So these guys also will fight for dominance and are very promiscuous, you could say. <laughs> and the gestation of these guys lasts about 390 days with a single foal being born. And they kind of stick around with their mother. So new mothers prevent other mares from approaching their foals without imprinting their instruction pattern, set of vocalizations on them. So it kind of just says, hey, it's mine. And the mares will actually leave foals in these kind of kindergartens while they're searching for water. They will not hide to their vulnerable predators, although they tend to be protected by adults, usually a stallion. So the stallion, even though it, it, they're in a territory, kind of just stay with the stallion and kind of be like, okay, I'll protect you. And they'll stay with the dominant stallion and the while the stallion has rights to mate with her. And the foal may not be his, but it ensures us to start, uh, this kind of deal that they have kind of ensures that the mare will stay in the territory. So it's most likely the next baby that she will have will be his. So it works out evolutionarily. And they have much longer nursing times and compared to others. And they'll be until three months before they start drinking water. And offspring become less dependent on their mothers after half a year. And associations will continue up to three years. So these guys are considered endangered with a wild population that's estimated to be about 1,500 or 15,000 in the early 21st century. And in the early 21st century, about 3,500. So that's a 75% decline. That's huge. There's estimated to be less than 2,500 living in the wild today. There's also an estimated 600 in captivity, where they live in the Wild Oak Cons uh, Conservancy in Florida, where more than 70 souls have been, foals have been born, and other conservation areas and sites have been trying to replicate that success and help them in the wild. And they're legally protected and are prohibited from hunting, even though a lot of their skins are fetch a high price on the market, world market, so often these guys can be poached and gonna be very good with that and also livestock is a big thing with people trying to survive and encroaching on their habitats so yeah there are protected areas that are doing okay and also there um there's a, a plant that was introduced into ethiopia about 1997 which is endangering these uh zebras it's an invasive species which is that um it's taken over the habitat of grasses that these guys like to eat so it's very very bad but these guys are seeming to do okay-ish at the moment and I think they're a really really cool species. We'll have a quick look at the baby though. It's a nice baby. Yeah. Look at this cute. I love the patterns. I love gravity zebras. I just like their uh they have a much more like tight pattern than like a mountain and they're also bigger. Who doesn't like big big zebras? It's wonderful. So yeah I think this is about a good time to end it. I uh, really like this one, I, and I really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to click that little bell icon to get notified when I upload anything. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video, you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye